benvenuti alla Via IU. I'm very pleased to see so many of you gathered here tonight for the opening ceremony of the fall semester. And you may recognize that the photograph was taken on the island. Um, uh, per la Via IU il 2012 è stato un anno assolutamente proficuo. 2012 has been rich in new achievements. Abbiamo acquisito un nuovo socio, una prestigiosa università, una delle più antiche in Europa, l'Università di Padova, rappresentata qui dal prorettore Alessandro Martin. Ma abbiamo anche altri prorettori, come il prorettore della Ca' Foscari e di altre università partner. We have launched with Duke University and you have a new laboratory visualizing Venice and this is the beginning of a new adventure for which we hold great hopes and I'm very pleased uh, that Professor Gianni Akian and others who have contributed to the launching of this institute are just here together with uh, uh, Mrs. Calabi and uh, um, uh, Donatella and uh, uh, the other representatives of UR. Well, these two events e quelli che seguiranno grazie ai contatti che stiamo intrattenendo con altre università di altri paesi consentiranno ai nostri studenti di avvantaggiarsi di nuove opportunità, di proseguire la loro attività accademica in un ambiente molto internazionale e soprattutto di fare delle esperienze personali che solo Venezia può consentire. And thanks to our agreement with the Italian Ministry of Environment, we have reached the impressive number of 8000 Chinese officials who have been trained here on environmental policies. E siamo perciò molto grati al Ministro Corrado Clini per aver affidato a questa università il compito di sviluppare questa straordinaria collaborazione con la Cina. Sono, come ho appena detto, oltre 8000 i funzionari cinesi che sono stati formati qui alla Via Yu sulle tematiche ambientali. Una terza novità, e molto importante, è rappresentata dall'elezione del nuovo DIN, la professoressa Agar Brugiavini che vi ha appena rivolto il suo saluto e che vorrei ringraziare a nome di tutti per quanto ha già fatto in questi mesi e quello che sta realizzando. Se ripenso ai suoi predecessori, al professor Ignazio Musu e a Stefano Micelli, devo riconoscere che questa università, caro prorettore di Ca' Foscari, si è sempre avvantaggiata di grandi talenti veneziani. I'm particularly pleased that tonight Ambassador Maurizio Serra, the Italian representative to UNESCO, has agreed to hold the inaugural lecture. He is an outstanding personality, not only in the realm of diplomacy and policy making, but also in the academic world. L'ambasciatore Maurizio Serra, che ci parlerà tra poco, è entrato nella carriera diplomatica nel 1978 a soli 23 anni primo del suo concorso. Ha svolto la sua attività all'estero a Berlino, a Mosca, a Londra e a Parigi. Conoscevo prima ancora del suo ingresso alla Farnesina le sue curiosità culturali e i suoi progetti, indipendenti dal percorso professionale, che teneva nel cassetto pronti per vedere lo, la luce alla prima occasione. Chi di noi ha letto le sue opere ha potuto ammirare il suo stile brillante, e constatare quanto vasta sia la, la sua erudizione nel termine e nel senso più positivo del termine. Non credo che Maurizio Serra abbia mai temuto il confronto con la pagina bianca o la faticosa dedizione alla ricostruzione storica della vita di alcuni personaggi del secolo scorso. La sua opera più recente è questa magistrale biografia su Curzio ma la parte che gli ha valso il prestigiosissimo premio Goncourt, scritta direttamente per il pubblico francese. Ma non abbiamo nulla da temere perché anche noi potremo presto leggerla in italiano, dato che uscirà il mese prossimo per i tipi di un grande editore di qui, veneziano, Marsilio. L'opera di Maurizio intitolata Malaparte Mala, Vie et Légende contiene rispetto alle altre biografie malapartiane precisazioni e puntualizzazioni importanti 
ma soprattutto, come ha notato un nostro caro amico comune, Francesco Perfetti, vi è una chiave di lettura nuova che insiste sulla dimensione europea della personalità di, dell'autore che ha scritto opere note in tutto il mondo e celebri in tutto il mondo come Tecnica del colpo di Stato o Caput o La pelle. Per Maurizio Serra, ma la parte può essere vista come un profeta della decadenza dell'Europa di fronte all'emergere e all'espansione delle nuove grandi potenze globali come l'Unione Sovietica, gli Stati Uniti o la Cina. O fronte, o a fronte ancora dei grandi, delle grandi ideologie di massa come il fascismo, il comunismo o il terzo mondismo. Si tratta di un, aspe- di un aspetto spesso messo in ombra da una lettura frettolosa dei Manaparte, considerato arci italiano, toscanaccio, eh, un personaggio pronto a muovere le mani o a menare le mani, ma pronto anche a cambiare casacca a seconda delle situazioni. Io spero molto che Maurizio, oltre a quanto ci dirà sull'UNESCO, voglia metterci a parte di questa sua ultima fatica e raccontarci qualcosa di un personaggio così controverso ma anche così affascinante. I've known Ambassador Serra for many years and during my time at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs I've had the opportunity of admiring his great ability as a diplomat and his remarkable talent as a writer. His presence here among us shines a special light on our courses on cultural heritage and should turn out to be a good omen to sign a cooperative agreement between VIU and UNESCO in the very near future. And I'm very pleased that the representative of the UNESCO office in Venice, Madame Yolande Valenef, is with us tonight. I'm sure that his talk, that perchance carries a title very close to the challenges and opportunities that UNESCO offers, and one of them is to work together with VIU, will be of great interest to our international audience. Immagino la vostra curiosità e sono certo che proverete ascoltando Maurizio Serra la stessa gioia che ho provato io ad ogni nostro incontro. Buon pomeriggio e soprattutto buon ascolto. Grazie. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm blushing. <laughs> I, d- I don't know really what to say now. I should only add that after 34 years of modest but uh, I think honest career in my ministry, I have a few friends. I have also a few who are not friends, it happens in life. <laughs> but among the friends, none is as close as my mentor, Ambassador Vatan. So if I may sit down in order to continue, because I have the uh, habit of writing on my pad, I have really no prepared speech. I've just assembled a few notes in order for us to have as open a discussion as possible of these topics, followed, I suppose, by um, a QA and a session. Uh, I would have to talk for perhaps 35 to 40 minutes in order to give a Uh, a broad picture of what UNESCO is at the moment, and uh, then I'm sure that through the questions we will energize the, the debate altogether. Um, the issue, uh, first of all, having said my gratitude and my honor to be here, uh, concerns the title. I, I wonder if I could be bolder than their challenges and opportunities bold enough, but would I say the crisis is an opportunity? Because at the moment, we have a crisis at UNESCO. We cannot hide behind that. We have a crisis in the financial situation. I will say a few words about that. Uh, But uh, as our Director General, Irina Bokova, uh, says, uh, crisis can be an opportunity if we see the seeds of opportunity that belong to crisis. And we take the possibility that is given to us Uh, to push forward the boundaries of what the institution today is. Let's go back to the origin. 
of what it was conceived to be. Among the 16 original agencies or related agencies to the UN, the brief of UNESCO in the late 40s, when our founding fathers uh, put down the charter of our uh, institution and our organization, was apparently the easiest and the less controversial of all. We didn't deal with economic matters, we didn't deal with social or uh, political texture of the world to come after the Second World War. We had to deal with culture and dialogue of cultures. And on that, we could think that there was a merit for everybody to work together. The problem is, but the opportunity is, that culture is in the broader sense of the term, and obviously the acronym stays for education, science, and culture, the possibly one of the possibly most acute political items of the international relation. The idea that culture doesn't belong really to the uh, most controversial aspects of the life of an international community has been many, many times confirmed by our activity. So we are, so to say, on two plans. One plan is to go for values and ideals that could be uh, a paramount importance for the international community at large, and at the same time to enter in the life of individuals. And obviously, when you start thinking about what the life of individuals is, is about in ethical terms, what concerns the education, for instance, one of the problem, one of the, not the problem, one of the programs which is most important today that we have in front of us, which has been tasked to UNESCO directly by the UN Secretary General, is the Global Partnership for Girls and Women's Education. Now, the Global Partnership for Girls and Women's Education doesn't necessarily signify the same thing in all avenues and in all societies. So we have to put together what we can uh, possibly make at the same time, taking into account that uh, the same words and the same concept may and have different meanings in different societies. I would also take into account another specificity of UNESCO that goes within. We are among UN uh, organizations, possibly the most horizontal one. We don't have a Security Council. We have a series of committee. One, possibly the most important, is the so-called Executive Board. But the importance and the main thrust of the activity of the organization always go back to the General Conference. We are always committees tasked by the General Conference. So we have to interact horizontally among ourselves and we are possibly uh, the most populous of all international organizations. We've won 90, 92 now with the last one that uh, exceeded last, last year, uh, organization. And all of them are on the same level. So the problem facing us is how to make this democracy work. We are a very democratic organization. We are proud about that. We are proud of the fact that each, and, uh, one, uh, each member can contribute and should contribute to what we do all together, but at the same time we have to take into account that it's enough of one member of a small group of members to interrupt the program, basically. So, you see, the problem is how to cope having the two objectives on the one end of a dialogue and of the other end of making it efficient, making it work in the international arena, making also the flag of UNESCO being visible enough. Uh, let's me let's allow me to take the last example, the last acute example in our days, the crisis in Syria. UNICEF now is very prominent there in what is the rebuilding of educational facilities. This is also a task we have. We have done that brilliantly in other cases of crisis, particularly after the terrible drama in uh, Haiti. Uh, we have to be prominent and to intervene in the other area. 
Now, there is a positive and a negative aspect of that. The positive aspect is that international organizations compete. There is a moment today when we see that international organizations are really where the shoe pinches. There is a certain fatigue of the international opinion in asking, but what on earth does the UN system in moment of acute need of international crisis, is it enough what they do? Is there no bureaucracy which is really taking uh, um, the, the important uh, role, whereas we should need to have more effective contribution. This is not an easy answer. Everybody in this room is versed in international relations and the complexity of international relations. We have to deal mostly, like all UN uh, system organizations and uh, sister organizations, with government. At the same time, more and more prominent, and we have created a committee for that over the years, are uh, non-government organizations and uh, organizations that encompass uh, concepts that are sometimes uh, discussed and not advocated by the government. So how do you make everybody work together? Um, this is, I think, where the crisis appear and not only in financial terms but also in identity terms. Uh, people are committed now to international organizations that deliver. We would like to deliver and we are trying to deliver more and I think that our Director General Ambassador Bokova is um, extremely committed to that but at the same time we have to take into account what the realities of international community are. I could dwell more on that on the debate on specific issues, but this is definitely uh, the most important element that we have to take into account. At the same time, we want everybody on board. We don't want that any country or any state feel that he is not part of the international effort of UNESCO, but we have to take into account that there are specificities, that there are sensitivities, and there are different speed in trying to reach the same goals. The other aspect of the opportunities, and at the same time the challenges we face today, is that we need resources, and we are in a situation which is very dramatic in terms of resources. We need resources because while we try to attract the best and most dedicated, um, uh, particularly young talented people, and obviously that could be of interest in uh, talking to such a distinguished university environment, to UNESCO, uh, we can't offer at the moment what we would always be able to give. Uh, and that's my plea in a sense that through, the all, through all the distinguished um, elements of international community that, convey, that are conveyed into this international university that has the pride of being a network of universities at the same time, uh, this message could really reach um, uh, far and be listened to. UNESCO cannot give what the private sector sometimes is able to give, but at the same time as an immense challenge and we see how it is attractive to different walks of society and how in uh, the most uh, far away places of the world still uh, the ideals that we have embodied in our constitution attract and are very vivid to younger and talented people. Unfortunately, we have a, a zero growth budget. Uh, I will not go back now because I think that they are vivid and obvious to everybody in this room to the reasons why, because of the freeze of uh, uh, the most important donor to and contributor to the UN, Italy being the second, incidentally, 
um, we are now on scale, we have scaled down our budget, the so, the so called C4, that is possibility of our increased budget for 2000, for the next biennium, 2012 13, and up to the beginning of 2014, to 600, roughly 600. And I'm, I'm, I'm under the scrutiny of Yolande Val, but I think that it is from 650 to 465 uh, million, uh, which obviously is peanuts compared to the enormous task of our organization. Education, culture, and science. This is of paramount importance, and at the same time, the main, I think, challenge of UNESCO today is how to attract and challenge private contribution to our activity. Incidentally, I think that this is a problem for international organizations as such, internationally. They can't, like in the academic world, if you don't channel the possibility of having uh, private means of having foundation and other organization contributing to the aims of our organization, it is not through national contribution or international contribution that this can be the case. This is dramatically the case for Italy. As I said, we are today with the freeze of the other great contributor, the first extra budgetary contributor to, UN, uh, to UNESCO, and the sixth, which is the U UN scale, to the ordinary budget of UNESCO. We have four or five, I, I, the, the, the difference between four or five is if we consider Venice is, as being partly national or partly a center, regional center of UNESCO, but we have two in Trieste now, one in Perugia. I signed uh, the agreement with the Director General. It's the water uh, program, water resource management program of the UN in Perugia. This is a very substantial uh, contribution. Um, I think that it was enlightened at the moment that Italy decided that uh, UNESCO was a priority, was a national priority. I don't think that with the Spanish review we are witnessing today, we will continue on this scale. And the same goes for the other main contributor. So we have to find alternatives. We have to find alternatives for programs. And that requires three elements together, which to me are essential. And this is a discussion. We will have our executive board next week. We will start a discussion. We have a, a so-called ad hoc committee, which, which is finishing today, Friday, uh, the preparative, preparatory work to the executive board. And there are three aspects which are very important. The first thing is, I'm, I'm turning now towards more internal issues, but in order to show you how we are working today, the so-called sunset clause, which has been a priority for Italy for a number of years. We have too many programs too many programs. We have to curb the number of programs and we have to identify visible steps where the programs are, have reached a, a speed cruise and then if they are not delivering enough, they have to be closed and we have to do something else. The problem with international organization is that you open quickly and then it is difficult to terminate. <laughs> It is difficult to terminate because if you close, you have the ideas either that you have reached your goal and if you have not defined the premises, Education for All, for instance, is a wonderful program of the UN, but how will you terminate that? It's impossible. But at some time, you have to discontinue it and to find avenues, to find niche, where to locate it. So we have advocated that the management gives us a set of priorities and a set of the timing of each program. And that will bring in our C4, this other document I was mentioning to you, that the so-called strategic objectives of UNESCO, this is again internal stuff to uh, Yolande, I and, uh, and a few others, but it gives you just the figure, the object, the strategic object objectives have been reduced to four from 14 to six in uh, the uh, next uh, um, uh, biennium, and this, I think, uh, shows it. The second thing is streamlining. Streamlining and <laughs> avoiding dupli duplications. Unfortunately, international organizations have a tendency to create sub-foras 
and UNIT, where sometimes the same issues are dealt in parallel terms and uh, the parallels don't meet at some point. Um, and this is uh, particularly important because it goes together with another action that UNESCO is doing at the moment, which is to decongest the headquarters. It's, let's, let's face it, it's very pleasant to live in Paris and to manage from Paris International Corporation, but we need dedicated people in the field offices. In fact, the DG had a bold program, uh, which was, I think, one of the finest issues that she had f tackled in uh, the first part of her mandate in order to foster field offices and at the same time to streamline them and to give the field offices the capacity to act. This is another problem that with financial freeze um, has been uh, somehow uh, in a geop put in jeopardy. But streamlining it doesn't depend always on facility. I give you an example, Mali. Mali, which today is one of uh, the uh, acute field of intervention of UNESCO. The heritage of the extraordinary cultural and archaeological values of the country is managed by our cultural sector. The manuscript, the manuscript, we were, we were talking about the island with the monks and the 20,000 manuscripts. The incredible array of manuscripts is dealt by another unit, which is the information and uh, communication. We can't do that. We have to find way. Amman, the, the field office there, responds for science to Bangkok and for culture to Cairo. We have absolutely to find an act. And this means pruning down. But pruning down is not an easy thing because we go back to the merit of, de of democracy. In a horizontal institution, you have to take into account and to tackle the need and the desire of some institution, of some countries, to show the flag there, to have the opportunity there. So at the end of the game, you have to reduce that in a homogeneous way, but you can't accommodate everyone. So this is one other aspect. In other uh, international organizations, particularly in the UN framework, you have a possibility to intervene directly with the intermediate bodies. But in our institution, as I say, we are all horizontally on the same level. So we may propose something, but then the conference, we will have a conference next year. Incidentally, the general conference will be a very important conference because it will have to appoint or reappoint the director general. And we bring all our staff to them and then we see what the Assembly of States does. The third point that is associated with that after sunset close and streamlining is making really the different part of the house work more closely together. For an amount of reasons, uh, um, the um, um, organization has a comparatively, and to me, when I arrived there two years ago, that was some cause of concern, um, weak uh, level of cooperation between the different regional groups. And this is not a problem of the management. This is a problem of the member countries, and particularly of the regional groups. Let me put it more clearly um, uh, for you. Uh, we are divided in uh, six uh, regional groups, and the six regional groups within themselves, they see the same documents, um, and they make proposals. Everything goes to the management, and the management equate the proposals of the different groups. But the different groups together don't work enough, don't work closely enough. The problem is that, if I have to put it bluntly to you, one group is the so-called, in fact we are divided in two subgroups, but to simplify, a group of the affluent countries, the country from the west. 
and the country from the West are very often seen as the countries that want to impose their values and uh, their systems to the others. Now, if we are on a day-to-day -day basis, we succeed in managing that without too many problems. But sometimes, we have had two crises this year. I just mentioned them. One has been the Palestine crisis, the other been the Obiang price crisis. If you would like to come back more into the debate. And in these two cases, I was astonished to see that the old reflex of saying the West won't impose something to the other groups uh, has been brought to the forefront of our debate. I don't think that it was at all the intention that we had, but it was perceived that way. So that shows that messaging the different sensitivities of the area of the world is still a commitment. So if we were not in a financial crisis, we could say, let's continue like we did. I mean, uh, in years where UNESCO was performing in the 70s or the 80s in a very visible way, uh, we were able to do at the same time that sort of uh, parliamentary, I mean, of broad dialogue of culture and, uh, and groups, and at the same time to have some areas of visibility, not all of them, but some areas. When you have less money to do so, the issue of decision comes in the forefront. And if you have the issue of decision, you cannot, uh, be, you cannot have everybody on board. This is the acute challenge of the organization today. You cannot think that everybody would agree to the same solution because, as I said before, sunsetting, streamlining, reducing, reducing bodies. I give you an example. We had, I have gone back to the papers. When the UNESCO started in the late 40s, we had one director general and three ADG, one for culture, one for science, and one for education. We have 12 ADG today. The 12 ADG correspond to areas of the world. Now the Director General has tried to um, reduce the number by putting together, this is the proposal tabled in this ad hoc group I was discussing, I was mentioning before, tab uh, the, that uh, emerging of two, sub two of the ADG section to reduce from 10 to 12. But it is the member countries themselves who have advocated the reduction that say no, because I don't want that Mr. X or Madam A goes away because represent my country. So this is where the shoe pinches, where you have to make choices. And because that's where I totally follow the DG in saying we have this great opportunity. Another thing um, I'm, I'm talking very freely with you because I think that's the reason why you have so kindly invited me today and not to, 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 to give you a full description which in any way would be easy to find of what UNESCO does. But I'm, I'm just concentrating on the challenges and opportunities. Another issue which is of, uh, I think, uh, acute importance is what we to do with human resources. We have had over the years, because we were tasked to do so many things, and a very complex network of uh, outstanding capacities, personalities, and things like that. But do we need them today? Uh, do we have to position ourselves in the international arena of organization as a lean body? with fewer priorities and fewer resources in order to streamline and to concentrate on what our task is. In fact, we have identified within the UN three mostly, which is cultural dialogue, which is development, and which is Africa mostly. Uh, Africa encompassing the three areas. But we have to, to deliver. The other day we had the ADG for Africa talking to us about 
the result or the non-result of some of the 22 programs that have never been implemented fully. It's not her fault, it's not the fault of the staff. Obviously, this is a particularly difficult area of the world, but we have to deliver. I don't think, I'm, my, my situation is a way, in a way is torn because as you may um, perhaps ascertain from my words, I'm very committed to UNESCO. I'm um, more a UNESCO fan now than I was two years ago when I arrived there. I, I think that there is a mandate there is a merit, uh, there is really a, a need of UNESCO in the international environment. But I am also a representative of my government. And because my government gives a lot of money to UNESCO, and because at the same time Italy is today, as we all know, in a difficult under difficult financial constraints, I have to see where the last euro, if not penny, goes. And this is what has to be the matter of tomorrow in uh, UNESCO term. Where are we exactly in that area? I think that the opportunities um, really correspond to what we can do today. I think that uh, UNESCO has an expertise, a record, a possibility to act which is impressive. And uh, we can definitely, I don't see any other agency within UN, UNICEF may be more visible in certain areas uh, and, and others as well, but that encompass such a wide mandate. But we have to be realistic. We live today in an environment of financial constraint and limitation at the same time of acute sensitivities in political terms, and I come back to my previous point at the beginning, culture is political. Let's not be naive, let's not consider that because culture concerns the highest echelons of, man, of humankind values, it is devoid of political implication. We had, I give you an example, I, I would wish, in particularly in the debate, I'm, I'm I'm closing now this preliminary part, uh, particularly the debate to go back on specific issues, but I give you an example of that. We had last week a full week session of the two bioethics committee. We have an intergovernmental and uh, a scientific committee. The, the, the expression is a bit clumsy because even the intergovernment is a scientific body, but it is decided by representative of governments, whereas the scientific committee is decided by representative of academies and civil society. Well, uh, for one week we worked and uh, we, we could find uh, a diplomatic compromise, so to say, but obviously it was just a compromise of an issue like traditional medicine. Traditional medicine it's something that encompasses in areas of the world a meaning which is completely different in others. Because in certain areas of the world, one would claim that scientific healing and medicine implies religious aspects, implies shamanism, implies the possibility of local people that have no scientific and medical are bringing in, in, not in, tradition, in Western terms to be of paramount importance. Where you stop that, if you say you should have international standards of medicine applied, some of the other parts would say, yes, because you want to sell your drugs to us. You want, no, no, well, there is an element of that. There is an element of that. There is an element of that. I mean, uh, it, it's, it, the issue is, is full of nuance. You want really, and possibly to sell the drugs to us that you are not able to sell anymore to your markets. So you see, we have been on one week on that. And then, obviously, the, I would say the, the philosophy of UNESCO is always to go for a compromise. But then there is a moment where you, you have to make choices and compromises are not enough. Another example where Italy leagues, I would say, more 
with countries in transition that with our Western partners. And it is illicit trafficking of cultural goods. Illicit trafficking of cultural goods, I have the dates here, I have the figures here, is possibly today the sixth form of illicit revenues in the world, after drugs and uh, hijacking and so on. And it deprives, in a, I would say in a, in a terrible way, some countries and some areas of the world of their cultural identity, because it is not just the question of the material goods, it's the fact of the international, of the cultural identity that goes with them. Now, the affluent countries are the market of exit of these goods. So, you have to find a program, and this is where Italy, who has the expertise since 35 years now of a, an exceptional unit, uh, we have made a, a much admired exhibition, I was very proud of that, also because I had nothing with it, I mean, I was just the ambassador, but it was them who did the real work, of the uh, uh, Carabinieri unit for, in, uh, for, 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 the, uh, for the fight against illicit trafficking of works that, that locate goods all on, over the Italian territory and return that to, to their governments. Government things that you find from Peruvia or Africa uh, origin. This is another problem where you have to find avenues of communication and find rules. Sometimes some of the countries that are more responsible, not, not directly, obviously, by the wish of the government, by the attitude of, of intermediators or, uh, or collectors or, or groups, or um, accept to have now bilateral agreements, but they don't accept to have multilateral agreements. So we are revising now, for instance, the 72 conventions on illicit trafficking and try to find a form of uh, possible new and uh, uh, more compulsive regulations that we have had in the past. So I've mentioned these two examples, one being, I would say, where the most conservative part, the fact of healing and me medicine, is in the non-Western world, and the other, the illicit trafficking, where the most conservatives are in the Western hemisphere to give you an example of a very difficult task. So when sometimes I go to university or institute and I'm asked, why doesn't UNESCO deliver enough? Uh, there were also a parliamentary commission asking us to give details of that. One has to take into account that universal mandate. And uh, I think we have to be grateful to our management uh, at all echelons, starting with the DG today, to be uh, absolutely um, uh, at the forefront of this international fight. But we need to have the support of our government. I'm very grateful that my, my government is, follows my task. Sometimes we diplomats uh, wonder whether what we write or what we say or what we try to make be, be known uh, reaches the good, uh, the good ears uh, of, our, of our government. In my case, I have, I have a sufficient feedback to know that is, so I am content with the job. But at the same time, we need that public opinions, and particularly the prestigious academic world, are on board with that in this task. So thank you very much. If I have brought to you uh, a vague uh, but at least uh, um, sufficient uh, concept of what UNESCO is trying, is embarked to do in difficult times, I think that uh, it has been... Uh, a way to, of uh, improving the dialogue, and I'm here ready to any questions you would like to ask me. Thank you.